this week on the show. Saving the Great Barrier Reef. This is just part of the solution. We have to restore coral populations, but we also have to manage climate change. Sightseeing by sub. The start of the descent under the water to the Great Barrier Reef. And RV adventures in the States. And a long weekend in London, our global gurus got tips for your trips. Australia's Great Barrier Reef is enormous. It's about the size of Italy, and you can see it from space. Around 10% of all fish species live here. As a diver, there aren't many places that can beat it. Due to increased water temperatures, there's been several mass bleaching events here in the Great Barrier Reef. 2016 and 2017 especially. Couple that with a severe tropical cyclone. And up to 80% of the reef was affected. For myself, an ocean lover, is very worrying. But there are stretches, like here on the southern part, that still thrive. Schools of fish, rays, sharks, and turtles are all abundant. I'm here to meet some of the people who've devoted their lives to keeping it that way. How perfect is that? <laughs> Billions of little tiny jewels. They were what, yeah. what were yeah, they? Yeah, blue green chromos. Oh my god, yeah, like just... little swirling jewels in the ocean. Yeah. It's incredible down there, Rachel. <laughs> wow. <It's so> <laughs> Rachel Jones has worked in these waters for 18 months now. The marine park authorities have rewarded her efforts by giving her master reef guide status. So tell me about the, the health of the reef we saw down there today. It's very healthy. There's just so much diversity here. I mean, that there, um, it's suggested 900 years old. Wow. So it's just coral that's died off and built up over time. What are some of the main threats facing the Great Barrier Reef? So we're all aware of the threats of the reef, you know, the rising sea surface temperatures, um, ocean acidification, we're all aware of it. But we need as many people as we can to see the Great Barrier Reef because they're going to fall in love with it, as you have, um, and then they go home and protect the Great Barrier Reef and all um, the reefs in the world. But then if more people are coming here, there's more people flying and therefore more carbon emissions, isn't that bad for the reef? We, we need as many people as we can to see the reef and, you know, they can choose sustainable options and every person that visits the Great Barrier Reef pays uh, an environmental levy, so they're playing a part. Um, every time they come. Rachel's based on Heron Island, about two hours boat ride from Gladstone on the Queensland coast. There's a resort and a research station built on the site of an old turtle soup factory. These days, people here want their wildlife protected rather than liquidized. So Andy, exactly how big is the Great Barrier Reef? Uh, it's immense. I mean, it's about the same surface area as Germany. 2,300 kilometers in length, thousands of reefs, hundreds of islands, massive. It sounds massive. It must be hard to survey the entire thing then. Yeah, that, so they reckon that 40% um, of the reef hasn't been surveyed. That much? So from a, from a conservation perspective, so massive. But imagine how the logistics you would require in order to do the whole, the whole reef would be you know, immense. Andy's the brains behind Earth Hour. That 60 minutes every year when businesses and landmarks turn off their lights to raise awareness of climate change. Here we are. Now though, he's turned his attention to the reef and is convinced education is the key to its survival. So what I'm gonna show you now is, is reef tracks. Reef tracks. Which um, is something that we've already launched and started to show the, um, the animals that have got satellite tags um, that are out on the reef. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah, cool yeah. Way. So this is um, 
Green turtle? Yeah, green turtle, tiger shark, whale shark. This is about to show you show you a whale shark. So this is the <laughs> first whale shark that's ever been tagged on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh-huh. And um, it lost its tag after about 4,000 kilometers, but it went all the way up the reef, then out into the Coral Sea, and then up into the Solomon Sea. The idea is to make people all over the world feel more attached to the reef and more fired up about protecting it. But the project he's hoping to launch next is even more ambitious and aims to give tourists here a proper role in data collection. We call it the Great Reef Census. And the idea is to, to try and do a, um, a state of the reef survey in a really short period of time. So you imagine that every tourism boat becomes a research boat for that period of time. And anybody who's like a proficient snorkeler who's out on those boats can become part of this project. So that's kind of in the water piece. But then beyond that, the citizen science, where the citizen science really kicks in is the analysis. So you've got this shot of a piece of reef. It's geotagged so you know where it is. Then you could be sitting in your uh, bedroom in Amsterdam or you know your office in uh, London and you can you can be part of the analysis. It's a really ambitious project so it's not been done before like this uh, or, or on the scale. Save some fun for me! Collecting information is one thing, but there's been a significant breakthrough this year that has seen new life brought back to dead and dying reefs. One night a year, the corals simultaneously release millions of eggs and sperm into the waters. It looks like a massive underwater snowstorm. Professor Harrison has set about capturing that spawn and relocating it to areas that need it most. Okay, what's the plan? <laughs> okay, Mike, so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to take these calipers okay. and just go down and measure the coral. He measures the new coral regularly and has found that it's been thriving, but he's also found that after three years, it's sexually reproductive, triggering a domino effect of regeneration. Can you tell us a bit about the breakthrough you've made? Yeah, so what we've been doing is some really exciting research. One of the innovations that we've just trialled in the Philippines is using an underwater robot, which we've called Luna, the larval bot. And Luna is helping us deliver literally millions of coral larvae onto really degraded reef systems. And the really exciting news is that we've got to hectare scales, which means we can start to think about large scale restoration using this larval technique on reefs all around the world, including the Great Barrier Reef. This is just part of the solution. We have to restore coral populations, but we also have to manage climate change. If you're thinking about coming here, but you're afraid you might cause it further harm, here's some tips we think might help. For most of us, a trip to Australia means a very long flight, resulting in lots of carbon emissions. You can mitigate that by paying a little extra to carbon offset your flight, using one of the many reputable schemes available, but also consider your flight plan. Many routes will take you into Sydney first, with a return shuttle to Cairns. That means more time in the air, so try to find a more direct route. Wear sunscreen that's considered reef safe. It should be fairly easy to find in shops once you're in Australia. Some of the ingredients commonly found in regular products are considered toxic to the coral. Also, after you put your sunblock on, wait for at least half an hour before entering the water to stop many of the chemicals from washing straight off you, causing even more damage to the marine life. When you're in the water, watch what you're doing with your body. Picking up, touching, and disturbing the coral is a definite no-no. But beware also accidental damage, particularly with your flippers. And when you're choosing a tour operator, make sure you look for one that works in a sustainable way. Look for the Eco Certification Badges, which are recognized by the Marine Park Authority. Badge holders have proven they operate to very high standards and that they go above and beyond when it comes to protecting the reef. Still to come on The Travel Show. The reef for non-divers. How eco-subs could give more people a fisheye view of the world underwater. 
I'm so excited for this. I can't stop smiling. So don't go away. Hello. This week, I have advice on spending three days in London, a family holiday to California and maximizing Mexico. First though, starting this month, New Zealand is imposing an admission fee, a $35 international visitor conservation and tourism levy, which the government in Wellington says will help protect the environment and pay for infrastructure. Also, from October, it's bringing in an online permit for travellers who don't currently need a visa. The New Zealand Electronic Travel Authority, or NZETA, will cost $9 via an app or $12 on the website. Next, Christine Mast gets in touch from the US to say she's planning a visit to the UK in September 2020. We'll only have three days in London, so what would you suggest we do there? I'm going to suggest that the key to your visit is getting a good geographical location right in the heart of Greater London, and that means Waterloo. That should mean you can walk everywhere in the capital in hopefully the warm autumn sunshine. Unlike many US cities, central London is compact and you can plan on shopping, sightseeing or visiting the great museums and galleries as you wish. Waterloo is also ideally located for a boat trip down river to Greenwich, the glorious Thameside suburb. And you can catch a train direct to Windsor, a pretty English town which happens to have an enormous castle attached. Tamsin Bao is heading in the opposite direction, from the UK to the US. With her 11 and 16 year old boys in tow, they're going on a family holiday to California, flying in and out of San Francisco with 18 days in between. We want to explore and have a bit of a road trip. Where should we go? And should we rent an RV? Take State Route 1 south from San Francisco to Los Angeles. The drive along the Pacific coast really is one of the world's great road trips. You can call in at Monterey with its great aquarium and also have a look at the scenery at Big Sur. After a couple of days in LA, you can swing around and head north for Death Valley and Yosemite National Park. I recommend against a camper van or RV the roads can be very tricky for what can be as large as a furniture truck. Much better, in my experience, to rent a car and stay in budget motels or at peer-to-peer -peer accommodation. I suggest in Yosemite National Park that you try camping and in the Los Angeles beachside suburb of Santa Monica there's always the youth hostel for Pacific Coast living at Midwest prices. Time to head south of the border. Ronald Smith wants to explore central Mexico. We want to start in Mexico City, travel to Puebla and then on to Oaxaca. Is this a good plan and is it better to use public transport rather than drive? Mexico City is one of the world's outstanding capitals. But to get some advice for you, I've called in an expert. Puebla and Oaxaca are two of the most beautiful states of Mexico, so it's a great plan. The first stop must be in Puebla. Here are spectacular tortures, colorful colonial houses and restaurants in which you can try the mole poblano, one of the most typical and old Mexican dishes. Four hours driving from Puebla, you will find Oaxaca. Here you can visit Hierbe el Agua, an incredible natural well site with petrified waterfalls and awesome views. Back in the city of Oaxaca, go to the temple Santo Domingo, eat playudas and drink mezcal. Rent a car. That way you can easily move from one state to another. The road that connects both states is safe and in good conditions. That's all for now, but do keep sending in your travel problems and I'll do my very best to find you the answers. From me, Simon Calder, bye for now and see you next time. For many people, diving at the Great Barrier Reef is a trip of a lifetime. There are few places on Earth you can come within touching distance of such abundant wildlife. This is Heron Island, 
just a couple hours boat ride from the Queensland coast. Scuba diving is an amazing way to see what's hiding underneath these waves. But if you can't scuba dive, there's other ways you can do that too. You can snorkel, you can take a glass bottom boat, but there's a new kid in town, something quite exciting. This sub belongs to Harvey. He's teamed up with a rideshare app and has been hiring it out for short trips. They're just getting it ready for us now. It's still not cheap though, at 3,000 Australian dollars for two passengers. What an incredible thing. That's just over 2,000 US dollars or about 1,600 pounds. This is it, the submersible. But Harvey thinks this is the future. Now so many more people can get underwater. Um, you've got a ton of people that can't for various reasons. You've got a ton of people that can't scuba dive. Uh, this gives people that ability to get underwater and explore and see what there is under the water. The submarine industry is still in its infancy. Currently, there are no other operators on this reef. Many deep sea ventures in other parts of the world require you have very deep pockets. You know, it's a small industry, but it is growing and expanding. Uh, submarines are inherently expensive. The rides are fairly expensive, but it is changing. And, um, and you know, costs are coming down, price points, things like that. Aquatica is working very hard to, to come to market with low, you know, lower cost submersibles to be able to get more of them in operation. Getting into the sub, this is usually the, the trick. Fun and games it might be, but in the safety briefing, you're under no illusions that this is a serious piece of kit. Do listen close to the staff. Do inform us, inform us of any pre-existing health conditions. Do bring your camera. You got your camera? Check. I got my camera. Don't wear excessive perfume. Do I smell? Small little spot. You smell great. We're good to go. Don't bring any matches or lighters. No. Don't drink lots of fluids before you dive. No bathroom. <laughs> There's no toilet. <laughs> okay. I think we're good then. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind hopping on the scale for me. Guess my weight. I'm going to say 86. 85. Dude, Not bad. You win the prize. There you go. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind hopping on here. This is for, for trimming the submarine. We just weigh all passengers, kind of like the helicopters, right? 86? Ah, <laughs> It is a tight squeeze in the three-man sub. It's actually a repurposed research vehicle. And after these tourist trips, it's off to the British Virgin Islands to survey some of the damage left by Hurricane Irma. All right. Ready to go down? I am ready to go down. All right. Calm's near bottom. Over. And here we go. We have just started the descent under the water what to the Great that? Barrier Reef. Look at this. <laughs> the water is slowly coming up and about to engulf us. <laughs> I feel a little bit nervous. Um, once you're fully submerged, <laughs> I have the feeling you're going to completely forget. Wow. The sub can dive to a maximum depth of 125 meters. We're just a few meters under the surface, but there's still great marine life at these depths. So here we have some chromis in the front, right? The little blue ones in the, in the coral. Yep, I believe yeah. those are chromis. And what else? We have? And what are these guys, like scissor tail sergeants or something they are, the striped ones? Gold, golden damsel, those little yellow guys. Yeah, oh, I see it good here. at this game. I'm getting really good at it. He's got the I got a cheat chart. sheet. Yeah, this is incredible. I can see. I can see how if you were a bit scared to scuba dive, and maybe you're, you have claustrophobia. I yeah. was thinking it was going to be much more claustrophobic. Confined, it's not. It's yeah, not, it would no. be acrylic. Just opens it right up. Topside, yeah. please advise us when the um, dive boat has passed over. So can you tell us a bit about how this is powered? Uh, the submarine is fully electric. Mm -hmm. We have a 240 volt DC uh, electrical system, you know, uh, electric thrusters uh, powered by lead acid batteries. And, uh, and that's about it, it's very simple. Yeah. So no yeah. emissions then? No, no emissions, no gas, no oil, no diesel, no nothing. It's incredibly environmentally safe. Um, nothing to leak into the ocean and, uh, and battery powered. And you know, we charge her up and away we go. So yeah. yeah. 
And we all know that the coral reef's quite fragile. Yep. So is there any issue bringing something so big down under the water? Uh, no, not at all, not at all. As you can see, she has tremendous control of the sub. Uh, you know, buoyancy control and whatnot, and manipulation, you know, with the thrusters. She can park it anywhere you want, and she can keep her nice and, nice and, nice and high off the reef and whatnot. And with the view you have, you know, traveling around, I mean, it works out very well and, and incredibly in control. You want to you know, try so you it? Get all tight. Can, Can I fly? drive it? Yeah. All right. Um, I might just grab it back if things go a little bit humpy. Um, so. Wow. Okay. Forward is forward. Just hold it low. All right. Yep. And I'll just do the vertical for you. You're okay. just gonna drive. So why don't you take us a little bit closer? So I I go I do. Just forward. This is forward. Yep. Whoa. And just don't touch those ones. Okay. And I'll just do a little bit. And I give her a little bit of back. That's a little too much. Okay. You don't want to run into the reef. That is a bad idea. I can't. Believe, I'm not qualified for this. But actually, it's quite simple, right? It's very much like a like a PlayStation controller, like yeah. a video game. Copy that. Perfect. Over. We are right in line with the jetty. Cool. Uh, we've made our whole round trip, and so now we're gonna pop up to the surface and head back to the dock. And it's all over. That was fun, though. <laughs> Some say we know more about the surface of the moon than we do the bottom of the ocean. What an opportunity this is to glimpse a world that so few people get a chance to see. Well, the sun's setting here on our time over the reef. For more from this wonderful but fragile environment, check out bbc.com slash travel, where you can explore some of the stories we've brought you from here in greater detail. But coming up next week... Rajan's in Florida, as the Kennedy Space Center marks its 50th anniversary of those very first moon landings, and looks ahead to being a hub for the space tourists of the future. And in the meantime, make sure to check us out on social media or on all the regular channels. Just search BBC Travel Show to tag us and your photos and your videos around the world. Until then, enjoy exploring, and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.